Thank you. Wonderful job in worship today, honoring God in every aspect of our service. You know, there's times in our lives where there's defining moments and things that take place that you'll never forget. Keith and Debbie Gandy, missionaries to Germany, um, they were at our conference just uh, about eight years ago or so. And then I took our staff from our church here to Atlanta to go to a conference, a pastor's conference, and Keith was at that conference, and we were together talking, and Keith started to share some things with me about his family and about his life. And uh, we said, hey, you know what, let's just, uh, let's blow this conference off and, and let's go to a restaurant. And we just sat at a restaurant next door to the venue where the conference was, and, and we just shared for uh, a few minutes, and we bowed our heads and we prayed in that conference about some things that was going on with his life. And there's a, there's a, a connection that took place at that moment that I, I always liked Keith, but now that we had that connection and we prayed over each other, we talked about what was going on, uh, we, we built that bond. Well, about four months ago, I got a, uh, a Facebook post, uh, probably from Debbie, that uh, Keith had a massive, massive stroke. And they didn't think that he was going to be able to make it through the night. And they asked uh, all the pastors and all the churches to pray for Keith because he was in very dire straits. And, and uh, Keith will say, oh, they just overestimated my demise. But it was, it was very sincere and very serious. So as I have watched Keith over the last four months, I am in awe of how God has taken care of him, healed him, restored him, and has given him the ability to still communicate and do his passion and that's to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to unchurched individuals in Germany. I, I sat yesterday and talked with him all day. Kind of, I was really checking him out to make sure he was good enough to preach on Sunday morning, uh, to be honest with you. But I was really just checking him out. And I felt his passion, his unbridled passion, to reach a generation that does not know Christ in Germany. And I was inspired because I think that is that same unbridled passion that we need to have here in Wichita, Kansas, that he has in Germany. And he would not, and he is not, allowing a physical problem that he endured to keep him from doing what God called him to do. That's courage. And that's the same courage that I believe God has called us to have. That we will overcome any obstacle that will keep us from doing what God has called us to do. I love Keith Gandy. I think Keith is one of the sharpest missionaries that we support. And I am honored to be his friend. Make him welcome as he comes and speaks with us about courage of ministry. Well, I certainly hope that go this goes well now. <laughs> After that. It is an absolute, just a, a thrill to be here. I absolutely love what you're doing here. Thank you, vocalists and musicians. The energy in worship today just absolutely just uh, spoke to my heart in a deep, deep and passionate way. Uh, I would like to share some things with you from my heart. What a great metaphor, not a fan. For all of us that come out of the sports fields and that, that is our passion, uh, what a great metaphor. Uh, from sports, from NASCAR, uh, or... or Ladies, uh, it, any fans of Downton Abbey here among us? Woot woot. Yeah, there we go. If you were in Europe right now, you would get to see it tonight. The season's already running, so just saying. So it doesn't matter what field we come from, there is there's just a passion that we have for certain things in life that just fascinates and capture our attention and make us enthusiastic. And Jesus is calling us to, to a level even above that, to rise above just being a mild interest uh, 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 but to be absolutely, totally sold out and dedicated to him. So that's what I want to talk with you uh, about today in just a, a, a small way. But can we clarify one thing at the outset? Just so that there's no confusion. There is only one hero in any of the stories that I tell you today, and that's the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and him alone. I would like to uh, share with you some photos that we have from, from Europe. We work with, uh, with uh, first generation Christians. What I mean by that, these people have never darkened the door of a church, don't know anything about scripture. So for them, they don't bring any etiquette into the church with them. So if we can have the first one, I want to introduce you to Domi. Domi is a 24 year old policewoman. 
She came to Christ and came to us. We discipled her. She said, I want to follow in believer's baptism. She comes from Polish descent, a Catholic background. And so uh, in, in our church, then we have a video that we, they tell their testimony. And after that, then we pray with them and then we enter the waters. And as I began to pray, I said, Lord, thank you so much for, for Domi's life and that you've entered her and forgiven her. And a voice from the crowd yelled out, don't do it. This is wrong. And I prayed, Lord Jesus, protect her in the coming days from all kinds of temptations and all the things, the darkness that would try and encompass her life. She was baptized as a baby. Don't do this. This is just plain wrong. It was her dad. While I was praying, broken hearted, that his daughter was now being baptized and tears streaming down his face. And I would, I would pray one a line and he would scream out another. This is just happen, happening live in church. And so I, uh, he finally left the building and, and I closed in prayer and said, Domi, are you sure you want to do this today? She says, my Savior was not ashamed of me. This is the day that I have to stand up for him. And so we baptized her. Can you show me the next slide, guys? This is Marco. Marco was so excited about, about Jesus. We have to tell you that we have a baptistry and it's, it's right in our platform because we just don't have a whole lot of space there. And all the chairs are right up against the platform, even. And so he took, a, he took a run from one side of the platform to the other and cannonballed into the baptistry. Next slide, guys. He hit the water. Our services thought Shamu had been baptized that day. <laughs> the front three rows were wet. It was up on the water. It was up on the cameras, everything. It's just wild. Uh, next slide, guys. This is Pia. Pia is the daughter of an East German politician. She was raised an atheist. She came because her brother was depressed, came to our church, and she heard a message of hope, a message that changed the life, and she accepted Jesus Christ, and I baptized her in the, in the Mine River there in our city, and lo and behold, while we're baptizing, a, a swan swims by. Go figure. That's just the way it is. Next slide, guys. I think it's our last one. So this is, um, this is our, our service. It would be very, very similar to here. Uh, very, the same feel that you have here. Your DNA is being exported to Aschaffenburg, just on the outside of Frankfurt. So when you come, you'll feel right at home. The only thing is, we just have a little small different dialect than you guys. <laughs> Accent sounds a little more German than what you do here, but otherwise, it's same, same exact songs that you, you sang today. We sing Sunday for Sunday there in Aschaffenburg. Even a couple of English songs in our. So when you come over, I'll have the coffee ready for you. Sauerkraut, we'll make sure it's warm. And, um, and you can join it because you have, you have made this possible. And we say thank you. So, pastor's already uh, spoken of a number of things of what's happened. So let me, let me kind of bring you up to date. Uh, I'm just so excited about what Jesus is doing and what he's done. Four, four months ago, on July 3rd, we're having some of these new converts into our home. We're discipling them, so we've invited them over for a Bible study. And just before the study begins, Debbie asked me a question and said, um, and I was supposed to respond, and I couldn't respond. It didn't come out. So she said, squeeze my hands. And my right hand squeezed it. The other hand was just not there. It just didn't there. And she said, um, something's not right. I think you're having a stroke. So I'm going to call for help. So she picked up the phone and said, what's the number for 911? <laughs> True story. <laughs> and uh, so she called, and about that time the doorbell rang, and the, and the, uh, the, the uh, attendees were starting to come, and I wanted to brush up on my notes, so I reached over to the coffee table, and I fell out of the chair I was sitting in, and face planted in our living room, and I couldn't get up. I couldn't move, and I knew I was in dire trouble. And the, 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 uh, the attendees came and picked me up off the floor and put me in the chair. And about that time, the EMTs arrived in the ambulance. They started drawing blood and asking some nominal questions. What month are we having? It's, it's July. Yeah, okay, he's at least cognizant. So they couldn't get the gurney through the door. What they did is they pulled in a stretcher, and those attendees picked me up out of the chair, put me on, the, uh, on this stretcher, and carried me and put me in an ambulance. They took, then, took me to the... Uh, to the local hospital and did a CT scan and they looked and they said yes right while we're speaking right now he's having a massive massive stroke I can't explain it other than the fact the hand of God but for the first time in 30 year history of that hospital they fired up the engines to a to a helicopter and put me on a helicopter and they flew me to Frankfurt to the very best neurological clinic in the whole vicinity just to save time they put me there and then uh, went in immediately and uh, began doing surgery and put a stint in a carotid artery 
because the whole right hemisphere of my brain. So about 10.30 that night, my, my family began to arrive, Debbie and the kids. They went to the doctors, and the doctor said, we cannot promise you that your husband is going to survive this night. Uh, we are doing the very best. We're struggling as much as we can, and he's stable right now, but we just don't know how this is going to turn out. But he has had a classic stroke. That means his left side is completely paralyzed. Speech, his face, his arm, his leg, nothing, nothing moves right now. Now, as I tell this story, I know that um, our church was very interested. They said, Keith, tell us this. Did you, um, did you see light? Did you see, um, did you see angels? Did you see grandma coming to greet you or anything? I said, no. As a matter of fact, it was exactly the opposite for me. They put me into a coma and uh, uh, put over a breathing, took over my breathing and put a, put a nose tube to feed me uh, and uh, went down into my stomach. And uh, about three days later, I started being brought out of this coma. And I can remember this male nurse leaning over the bed with this impish grin. He looked at me and said, I just put a laxative in your nose tube. <laughs> no, I didn't see light. I saw darkness and demons. <laughs> That's what I saw. But there were people around the world that were praying, praying that God would do something miraculous. And if you were one of those, I'm still mad at you a little bit. You're the reason I didn't get to go to heaven yet. <laughs> so, but God did something. Matter of fact, uh, eight weeks later, then I would be back for the very first time. And then uh, after 42 days of hospital and, and therapy, then I was back and then preached in our church. And uh, an amazing story. At the end of the service, I told the story just like I just told it right now. A lady came up I've never met before. She stood in front of me and she said, the story you told is true. I said, yeah, I know it's true. She said, no, but you don't understand. See, I'm a nurse. I decided something down deep and said, you need to get back into church. So I decided to come to church today, just by chance. And I was the nurse in the operating room during your surgery. I'm the one that actually monitored your vitals during that. And we, you're right, we did not know that, um, that you were going to survive. We did not know if you would make it through the night. And here, eight weeks later, we don't, we don't see the kind of stuff that I'm seeing right now. You're standing up erect and speaking speaking, articulating, and bragging on Jesus. said, I don't know what's going on here, but I can tell you, God's doing something here in this church. This is where I want to come. So Kirsten Bills comes and attends our church, doesn't miss a Sunday now. God is doing some pretty miraculous things, and we are just so excited to see, see how things are happening. If you've got a Bible with you today, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 6? That's where I would like to look. We live in a, uh, in a time where we need, we have some very big needs, and... Um, I want to speak to, to you, those today. Ministry, you know, is not really that complex. For those of you that really want to get involved with Christ, it's not that, that difficult. John Maxwell has even got some key pointers for us, and I'm going to kind of give you them if we'll pop those up really quick. Here, all, all people have some things in common, and therefore, if we'll just kind of drill down on these, this is what, what we need, and it's not that, like I say, it's just not that difficult. People like to feel special, so sincerely compliment them. They like to feel special, so sincerely compliment them. Number two, they want a better tomorrow, so show them hope. Hope. They desire direction, so navigate for them. Navigate for them. They are selfish, so speak to their needs first. They get low emotionally, so encourage them. And all people want to succeed. They want success, so help them win. Help them win. But like the, ju the judges of old, there are Midianites in our land. Midianites that uh, hold us in bondage and are suppressing our people. Uh, I don't know if you know it. Of all the sports that we're t speaking about with the metaphor right now, the three major sports that we have in America, we have uh, NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball. And the revenues that are generated by them are absol absolutely astronomical. But if you take all of those, all of those uh, revenues generated by those three major sports together, they are su surpassed simply by the, uh, the amount of pornography that is sold in America annually. All of those revenues are succeeded, superseded by just porno alone. Midianites hold us in bondage. Uh, we have in Germany, one out of 12 families cannot pay their bills this week. We are in financial bondage. Midianites that hold us in suppression. Creditors that give easy credit uh, are, are car credit and title, title loans and, and exorbitant rates of 
of interest, and people are held in bondage. It's just awful. And so what we need, like in the days of Midianites, we need a Gideon to rise up to say, like the, um, William Wallace in the movie Brave, Braveheart, at least to cry out the word, freedom, freedom. Somebody that will stand up and have the courage to say, there is a possibility for a better tomorrow. There is a change. And that is in Jesus Christ. But somebody's going to have to have the courage to do that. We need husbands and dads to rise up and to be a Gideon in their family. We need some Gideons to rise up for our city. I don't know if you notice it. We are a very dysfunctional society, aren't we? We have politicians that can't speak to one another. We came to the brink of economic destruction just a few weeks back. We need somebody to stand up and say, I will be that person. Cost what it may, I'll pay the price. I'll be that Gideon. But like Gideon of old, there is the self-doubt that rises up and we say, I don't know if he could use me. What I need to see is a miracle. If God would just, if he, I'm going to take my, um, my seat cover from the car, I'm going to put it out here. The fleece, I'm going to put it, and here's what I want. I want that to be wet, but the ground to be dry. God, show me a miracle because I, I just don't think I've got the, the competence. I don't think that I've got the ability to be able to address the great needs. I know that there are some needy things. I've got friends and family that need to be free. But I don't see me as being that kind of person. And so he is calling a Gideon here out of this group to not just be a fan, but to push Texas Hold'em all in and say, I will be that person. I will rise up and I will do something. I will make a difference in my church, in my city, in my society for the kingdom's cause. I will do that. And, and he wants to show you a miracle. But there is something that's standing between you and uh, being that, that brave heart deliverer. There's something that's, that's standing, and we're going to see that in this passage in Mark chapter 6. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to join me in verse 42, uh, because that's where we're going to begin. The disciples are there on the Sea of Galilee with Jesus, who's moved now from Nazareth to Capernaum, and he's ramping up his ministry, taking it to the next level. And uh, out, turn, turn, there's a turnout for, for, um, for him, for this. Um, he's going to teach and uh, we see in verse 42, Jesus dismisses them because it's getting to be evening. But he says, um, but before they go, they have to eat. They've come a long way. So disciples do something about that. And they said, we're not, we're not qualified for that. So Jesus takes over and he feeds them. Let them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. How many fishes and how many loaves do we have? And they just have a few. And so he breaks that up. He thanks God. And he, and he starts passing out and everybody eats. So verse 42. So they all ate and were filled. All. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those that had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. 5,000 men. And where there's 5,000 men, there's going to be at least six or 7,000 women. And where there's 5,000 men, six or 7,000 women, there's going to be another eight or 10,000 kids. That's why we estimate there's probably about 20,000 people here. And Jesus has done something absolutely amazing. And the disciples see this and they're going like, what happened? And so they take all the leftovers and they start putting them in baskets. Baskets were just the New Testament version of Tupperware. So they, they have all of this love, leftover food and uh, now they've got to dispose of it. Now look in the next verse and see what happens. Verse 49, uh, 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side of Bethsaida. He, uh, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Jesus says this, <clears throat> it's not enough that 20,000 here. There are people on the other side that have to hear. And so therefore you've got to get in the boat and you've got to go over there. And we're going to then continue this on the other side. Church, it's not enough that Wichita hears about Jesus Christ. We have to get in the boat and we have to go to the other side somehow, some way. You have to find a way, and I don't know how that code will be broken, but you have to figure out a way to get the masses and the millions in Europe to hear, hear the gospel plan at least one time clearly. That's our job. Well, for the disciples, it's, hey, this is great. Now he's finally asked, us, we're fishermen. Get in the boat and go to the other side. Okay, we row. That's what we do for a living. We're good for that. We've been to the other side hundreds and hundreds of times. Not a problem. Well, Jesus goes off to pray, but they said, let's just get at it. Let's just start rowing. They start out. Now, I'm telling you, Jesus is trying to teach them something very deeply because they're... He has gifted all of us with talents and abilities. And the ability they have brought to the table is rowing. That's what they do professionally. And they think, got this under control, Jesus. Okay, see you in a few minutes. We'll, uh, we'll be over there ahead of you. And um, look at the next verses. And when he sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, 
for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed by them. So here's what happens. They're out, and they're rowing, and through this wind channel, they're in the Sea of Galilee, coming from the north. Wind is, is buffeting them. So the situation that rises up, they're just not making any advancement. And they're frustrated, and now they're starting to be angry. We're normally rowing, and we, we make some headway, and now they're not. And uh, they're totally frustrated, and Jesus sees that. I don't care what your circumstances are and how bad the storm is. Jesus wants to be with you. He's going to find a way to get to you. Uh, but well, he's going to teach them a very deep thing. And this is something I had to learn a few years back. Let me share it with you real quick. I came in, flew in uh, from Europe one time and uh, stopped in with my parents. My dad said, Keith, the neighbors across the street have a problem. The toilet's leaky. We need to put on a new wax ring. Could you come help me? It will only take 15 minutes. Now, I think you know where this story's headed already, but don't get ahead of me. Sure, Dad. I can't turn my dad down, so sure, I'll help you. So we go over there. He turns off the water. We unbolt it. We pull it off. We put the new wax ring down. And now, the thing is, the house has settled a little bit, so now the toilet rocks. I don't know why, but rocks in place. So he says, now I have to go over to the garage and find some shims to come back over there and put under this thing. So he goes over and searches for a while and comes back. He says, put the hoses back on it. So I do. I put the hoses, and he says, okay, now open the valve. And I reach up there, I can't even turn it with my hand. I said, Dad, it's, it's stuck. And he goes, well, put that big wrench on it. So I, I get up there with a the wrench. And Dad, Dad, that thing is really, really fat, uh, solid. It's not going anywhere. He said, well, just, just put a little elbow grease on it. No, you do it. I'm not going to do that. So he reaches up and goes, clunk, and it snaps off inside the wall. This is only going to take 15 minutes, right? He now snapped on the wall. So he goes and gets a hammer, comes back and it pounds a big hole in the sheetrock, and now we've got this hole, and with the copper pipe is snapped off, and so now he goes over to the pump plumbing supply and gets the little pieces and comes back, goes to the neighbor and gets a propane torch so we can solder them together. So he starts soldering, and a few minutes later, what's that? Lo and behold, with that propane torch, he's caught the, the wooden studs of that wall on fire. <laughs> so now we have to then get this, it's only gonna take 15 minutes. So now we take, we take a hammer, and at the top of the wall, we punch a big hole, and well, we've turned off the water, so we have to go to the neighbors and get all the garden hoses, hook up to their supply, and we come back in, and we play firemen. So we, we turn on the water, and we're in the, inside the studs of the wall, putting out the fire. It's only going to take 15 minutes. And I think you've, you've had this happen. And uh, at the end of this, we finally finished it up, and then he had, of course, a number of days just to patch, patch all the busted sheetrock. What's the point of the story? Well, the point is this. As I look back in retrospect, never once did it ever cross my mind to sit down and, Lord, would you please watch us as we're doing some work here. Do you know why? It's just a stupid toilet wax ring. Anybody can do that. I don't need you, Lord. Uh, you know, I've got this under control. Got this one. It's on me. I'll not bother you with this. We can row. That's what we do. And there is something, there's something about us that, that drifts automatically away from Jesus. And Jesus is trying to teach them, apart from me, you can do nothing. Therefore, it's not enough to be a fan. You've got to be all in. You've got to be a follower. You've got to be completely connected to me. You've got to make sure this happens. And the key is in the next verses. Here's what he's going to show us. Look at verse 49. And when they saw him walking on the water, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all had seen him and were troubled. But nobody recognizes that it's Jesus. But immediately he talked with them and said to them this, you need to underline this, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves, beyond measure, and marveled. And here's the reason, for they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. And here's the thing about you and me, our hearts drift. We can see miracle after miracle after miracle. If we self-doubt, God, would you... Would you, would you bring a miracle by? Would you show me something? That would then give me the confidence that, yes, you do want to use me. And so Jesus is jumping through hoops to trying to, trying to make sure that we're always on board. And he says, I want to use you. I want you all in, and I'll show up, and I will do the miraculous in your life. And the reason is because our heart tends, when we're rowing and circumstances are not going our way, what happens is our heart tends to get hardened. And I would venture to say that there's probably dads. There are probably moms here that are frustrated. You've got teenagers at home and they can't, you can't even get them to make, the, make their own bed or clean up their own room, let alone change society. And you're hard, then it's starting to become hard. 
please let me just be completely honest. One of the easiest places to become hardened and bitter and cynical is in the ministry. Staying close to Jesus, seeing miracles, and then when things don't go your way and you're not making progress and you're rowing and you're trying as much as you can and it's not going anywhere, then your heart tends to get hardened. And I have to revisit this passage again and again. Courage is not built on the fact that, the fact that we, we have no fear. Courage is built on the fact that you spend time with Jesus. When Jesus is in your boat, that's where it gives you courage, being with him. And, but the problem is a hard heart does not see Jesus. A hard heart will often even miss him even when he's just feet from us. When he's even walking on the water, we don't see it. So that is what's going to hold us back from being the, the uh, brave heart deliverer. So what is, the, what, is the, uh, what is the solution? Well, the solution is what he gave earlier in verse 50. Immediately he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. We have that in the ESV also, which says it like this. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Here's what he said, you cannot be passive in the, in the, in the face of circumstances. Circumstances bring you hit this back and forth. He says, but you have to take heart, you have to be proactive about following me, you have to take courage, you have to take heart, because it's me. I'm doing something in your life, therefore, guard your heart. You can't control your circumstances, but you can today, you can control your attitude. That's what you can control. So he says, take heart, it's me. Be of good cheer, be courageous. Robert Murray McShane, one of my heroes and a pastor, Scottish pastor, he said, he is the vine, we are the branches. Just make sure that your branch does not grow into wood. Then it doesn't, it's not pliable and will not bear fruit anymore. And so he's saying to us now, don't have a hard heart. He says, be of, be of good cheer. Um, can't control your circumstances, but you can control your, you can choose your attitude today. Chase Christ, don't chase courage. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, pastor and author who was one of the last men in Germany that was uh, on, uh, by Hitler before Hitler committed suicide, he said, make sure that he is killed before, the, before sunlight tomorrow. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this, Christians cannot be governed by mere principles. Principles carry one only so far. At some point, every person must hear from God, must know what God was calling him to do apart from others. You can't take your cues from popularity and just from society. God needs a Gideon to, to rise up. Our society right now is calling, is calling and begging for someone here to be that Gideon in their family, to rise up and be that Gideon here in this church, for youth, for, uh, for your neighborhood, for your house study, for, um, for this city, for our nation. For missions worldwide, somebody is going to have to rise up and be that Gideon. One of my favorite, favorite um, uh, heroes is, uh, I'll be completely honest, is my wife Debbie. Um, she has shown me more courage. She is by nature not a risk taker. I'm an adrenaline junkie and just, would, just love that kind of stuff. Uh, but, um, but she is one of those that it would rather be a little more safe. Our church had been growing, and in 2003, we just didn't have enough room to house them. 2004 came out, we, could, we had the opportunity to buy a building, an old warehouse, and we could renovate it and move into it. But it was going to cost us $1 million. $1 million is a lot of money for me, just to be honest. So we took all of our bookkeeping to the CPA to see if we can get a loan, and he went through everything and he said this, Keith, I'm going to give you one word of advice. People don't go to church in Germany. If this thing goes south, if you get a line of credit and you can't pay it back, you and your wife are going to be held personally accountable for this, and you're going to lose everything. You'll have to declare bankruptcy for the rest of your lives. You're going, to hold that, uh, you're, you're going to owe that debt. So I'm just advising you, don't do this. So we went to a number of banks, and they gave us the exact same response. Well, uh, time went on, and um, I'll never forget the day that we were driving down the road. We were going to go and do something at the building uh, with the architect. We scheduled to meet him. As we're driving the ro down the road, Debbie was with me, and she said to me, Keith, we need to talk. Gentlemen, if you've been married any while, you know those are wor words that, that just bring fear to your heart, don't they? <laughs> we need to talk does not mean we need to talk. It says, that means this is going to be a monologue, and you're going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so I was smart enough at that time just to listen for a little bit, and so, so Debbie said these words. She said, Keith, I've thought about it long and hard, and they've told us not to do this. She said, but listen to me. 
She said, if any church is ever going to be built in this city, somebody is going to have to take the risk and do it. It might as well be us. And furthermore, if we do this and we can't pay it back, and we do lose everything and we're bankrupt the rest of our lives, know this, it will have still been worth the effort. It would have been right to do. That's Gideon. That's Gideon. Now, some of you here need to rise up with that kind of courage and step out by faith, throw your leg over the boat and say, Jesus, I'm coming to, I'm coming to be with you. I just, want, I just want to be there in your, in your presence. Some of you are still saying, I just want to see a miracle. If God would just somehow, the self-doubt, I don't know that he wants to use me. Well, let me see if I can bear it out one more time. The first thing that happened after I, I was taken out of ICU after six days, they, they started trying to do therapy on me and said this, Keith, um, what is it that you would have as a goal? What would you like to do? And I said, well, what I would really like to do is I would like to, to um, get out and I would like to play a round of golf in a tournament. They said, well, you can forget that. We don't crush your hopes and your dreams, but you can't even make it to the bathroom unassisted. We have to carry you there. There is no way that you can, that you can um, play a round of golf. 42 days later, I was out of the hospital. And the first thing that I did was I enrolled in that, in that stupid tournament. I said, count me in, I'm there. And uh, September 1st, true story. Uh, guys, if you would throw that on the screen, not only did I successfully walk 18 holes of golf, I won that stupid tournament. <laughs> And if you're doubting right today and you say, Jesus, just send me a miracle. Send me something to show me a sign that you have something in store, that you're trying to do something big. Here it is. Here's right now. Just the fact that I'm standing. Any day you're vertical is a good day, by the way. I know that now. And um, that's, that's a miracle. I'm calling here as clearly as I possibly can. Somebody here has to be that Gideon. And the thing that stands between you and being that champion delivered to cry freedom to be the example to your, sis, uh, your system, to your to your family, to your neighborhood, to your school, to this church, to this city, is, is a hardness of heart. Please, would you, would you bring that to Jesus Christ today, and would you say, please, be I, I see miracle after miracle, and I just want to participate in what you're doing in the kingdom. Would you today push all in? Step to the next level from being a fan to be a totally, wholly dedicated follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we stand with every head bowed and every eye closed? I would love to pray for you. I'm going to call you to two things today. There, is, there are some fathers here that, that probably need to bring their hearts to Jesus Christ and say, yes, my family needs a Gideon. I want to be that guy, but I have to bring my hardness to him. Maybe, as I pray, maybe it's, he's speaking to you to step out and say, okay, take that first initial step with me. Give me not just uh, an indication on Sunday that you like me, but follow me. Maybe this is your time to step out and say, I want your forgiveness, Jesus Christ. I want you to be involved in my life. I give you everything I am, everything I will be, everything I hope to be. I give it to you. Um, the second thing I would like to call you to pray for is would God, some of you possibly during this time, we're going to sing a verse of invitation song and, and um, Pastor Al is going to lead as he sees fit, but would some of you possibly step out and lay a hand on your pastor, Pastor Bruce? Would you, would you pray that God would protect him um, I love him so much. I am drawn to him like a moth is drawn to a flame. There is something about his passion and his energy for Jesus Christ that ignites my soul. But that does not make darkness happy. And therefore, darkness will throw everything at his heart. Would you, like people prayed for me around the world and protected my life, would, you, would, would a few today say, we love you, Pastor, and we, we just want to protect your life. We want to pray for you. Um, so I want to pray for you, and then, and then Pastor Al can lead in any way that he would see fit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you today, and we just cannot still comprehend and grasp how that you love us with such an everlasting, passionate love. But we say thank you for it. And we're right now bringing our hearts like Gideon, saying we still have self-doubts, and we don't even see us as being competent and able to do anything. But would you, would you raise us up? Would you raise up a whole, a whole nation of Gideons that would not only trust you, but with, with uh, your bidding and by your spirit, that they would go out and, and cry freedom, freedom throughout the land. We ask for your grace for Pastor Bruce and his family and Leslie and, and their boys. We're asking that this ministry would continue to be this beacon of hope and encouragement, navigating people through the dark days of life. Thank you for all that's happening here, and we're just entrusting you 
to give miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And even when others say, it's just not possible anymore, it, you can't do it, that they would also then just say, victory, victory is mine, says, says God. And would they claim it in your name? We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Al. Thank you. you. May be seated. Thank you, Keith. What a great uh, message that was today. And and um, since you asked the special blessing upon our pastor down here, do you realize that this is the fifteenth uh, year that this family has been here at Glenville? So, Pastor Bruce and Leslie, won't you come up here for just a minute? And uh, I know I'll get chewed out tomorrow, but that's okay. And where's Brett and uh, Bryson? Are they in here? Now come on up here. Yes. I was thinking the other day, you were 35 years old when you came here, weren't you? Huh? What color was your hair? It wasn't that color, I bet, was it? Well, in October, you just celebrated your 15th anniversary here at Glenville. And I know, yeah, give him a great hand. Did you do that? I tell you what, we've got a great family leading us. My wife and I really appreciate this family right here, and I know you do too. And Pastor Bruce, we really appreciate your leadership and your guidance, and Leslie. And uh, I think we was eating lunch here uh, a couple months ago, and I said, you know, you've raised some pretty good kids. Well, at least one, and I'm not, no, I'm just, <laughs> don't start that, okay, all right. But uh, I know we didn't take time during the missions conference to let you know how much we appreciate you. And 15 years is... I always get this mixed up. It is a milestone.